Good morning. Welcome to CCM. It's a new day. Oh, it's a new time. And it's a new way. I'm going to live my life. All the old has passed away. And the new has come. Thank God. It's a brand new day. Looking back on yesterday, there are things that I regret. Well, good morning, church. Happy New Year, and welcome to Christ Community Fellowship. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for coming together with us as we kick off the new year in probably the best way imaginable, imaginable worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hey, if it is your first time here this morning, uh, if you would, back on the tables as you walk in, we have a Connect card. Would you fill that out? Would you tell us a little bit about you so that we can welcome you back better the next time you join us? And if you are tuning in with us on the live stream, uh, we are glad that you are worshiping with us this morning as well. My name is Joey Culvert. I'm the student pastor here at CCF. It is our goal, it is our mission, it is our vision as a church that we bring people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And we do that by learning from Christ, living in Christ, and leading others to Christ. Uh, my only announcement for the student ministry is that we will meet back starting this Wednesday for Bible study at 6 o'clock upstairs. We'll feed you guys. And we're also starting small groups this week, all right? So we'll have our lesson, and then afterwards we'll break off into small groups and we'll dive into everything just a little bit deeper. So be here for that. It's going to be really exciting. And for the rest of the church announcements, uh, John Ponder's Bible study will meet on January 4th at 6 p.m. up here at the church. Uh, senior ladies will meet for lunch at Papa's on January 5th at 11.30 a.m., uh, Sunday breakfast will be next Sunday at 10 a.m., and that is served by Team 3. So if you are on breakfast Team 3, uh, you're doing breakfast next week. And then also there will be a women's group that will meet Wednesday, January 11th at 6 o'clock here at the church. And all ages are invited to that. And then Sunday morning Bible study is on Sunday mornings at 9.15 at CCF, and that is taught by Mr. Gary Newcomb. All right, and now for an even better way to kick off the new year. Bobby? All right, so this is Will Wright. This is the son of Scott and Andrea, and we visited a couple of weeks ago about his decision for Christ, and Scott and his, I guess Scott and Andrea both were, were with Will, and he began asking questions about baptism, and he prayed and asked Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. And so we are excited to be able to start this new year off together in really the right way, and that is to baptize somebody who's given their life to Jesus this morning. And so we have, of course, his father here's, who's here with me, and he's going to baptize him. Because again, I think that's just such an incredible bond, an incredible opportunity for dads to get the opportunity to baptize their sons and their daughters. And so with any, without any further ado, Will, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Well, it is upon that profession of faith in Jesus that we baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're buried with him in baptism and raised to walk in a new life. Amen. Well, what a way to celebrate the new year by having, you know, little Will come up and publicly profess his faith in Jesus Christ. I can't think of a better way to kick off a new year. Well, church, we are delighted that you have joined us this morning for worship. If you would, would you stand with me? We're going to go into a time of prayer this morning, and then we're going to continue to worship our Lord and Savior. Father God, thank you so much, Father, for 
for today, for the many blessings you've given us. God, thank you for the year that was 2022, despite all its ups and downs, Father. It was another year of life. God, thank you for 2023, for the year that you've put before us, Father. As we go into this new year, Father, I pray that we all follow you, that we follow you. We walk by faith this year, Father. Father, be with our church. Help us to continue to grow. Um, Help us to grow individually, and as we grow individually, grow our body. Father, I pray for the church across the nation, across our world, Father, that God, as we, again, as we go into this new year, help us to grow. Help us to reach those who need to be reached this year, Father. Help us to reach those who need to experience your love, maybe for the first time. God, I pray as we worship you this morning, God, help us to have open ears, open hearts, and open minds, Father, to hear your word, to understand your word, and then to hide it away in our hearts, that we might not sin against you. God, be with Bobby as he speaks this morning, Lord. Help us to learn something new. Help us to take it out of here with us so that we can go back to our, to our work, to our, uh, to our homes, to our practices, Lord. Wherever we go, we can be a kingdom influence. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
brothers, sisters, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Leave your sins and all your guilty stains. Let the river of life wash it all away. You've been searching.
When I feel afraid, I think I've lost my way. Still, you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Did that video stress you out just a little bit? And you get four weeks of it. So um, we're doing a series called Breathing Room. And by the way, Happy New Year and Happy 2023. It seems weird to even say that. And so, but here we are. And I thought, what better way to kind of step into 2023 and maybe just have a little bit better or maybe a fresher approach and really kind of have this opportunity and time to just have some breathing room. You've been running around from Christmas and New Year's and everything, and, and it's sometimes we just get so, I feel so busy. 
Like, it just feels like things kind of clutter up. You know what I mean? When I was in college, I had a roommate, my first roommate in college at Washita. Actually, I wasn't a freshman because I'd gone to another university. When I transferred to Washita, I ended up having to live with a freshman guy who was fresh out of high school. And I noticed there was something about him that was completely different than me. And that was this. He liked clutter. And when I say he liked clutter, he would have so much stuff stacked onto the floor. There would be books and things just, and they would be just all stacked around him. And we we ended up having to come up with an agreement because I'm not like that. That kind of clutter bothers me. It stresses me out. I can't handle it. I just would come into the dorm room and I felt like it was like a blob and it would just get bigger and bigger and eventually it would reach over and it would eat me. I mean, it was just so much stuff in there. I mean, by the time we finished college, we found a cat living in our, in our uh, seat cushions of our couch and it was eating the food that we had been dropping in the seat cushions of the couch. I mean, that's how much clutter was in there. Not really, we didn't really find a cat, but you know what I mean. There was so much clutter. Y'all, some of y'all are going, for real? No, not for real. Come on now. But seriously, he had so much clutter. And I came up with an agreement with him. I said, look, you just got to leave me a pathway. I just want to be able to walk into the room. I just want to get up at night and use the bathroom and not worry about falling and waking up in the middle of the night at some point or another because I got a head injury because I fell over your piles of stuff. I mean, literally, I wish I had a picture of what the room looked like because, I mean, it was literally stuff stacked up this tall all around. And so I would walk into the room, and it was like I had, I had handrails. I could hold on to his stuff and walk straight to my bed. And so for some of you, you hear that, and you go, I don't hear a problem yet. Like I'm, you're waiting. Some of you are waiting for the problem. Some of you, you have a closet, and it looks maybe like this. And some of you are sitting there going, what the deal is. That looks fine to me and doesn't bother me one bit. I mean, some of you, you, matter of fact, some of you, you feel comfortable right now. That picture makes you feel good. Others of you, your anxiety levels just went up. You just went, like you're breathing, you're panting. Some of you are panting. You're just sitting there going, how in the world? Some of you, you're married to that, aren't you? You're going, mm, don't be pointing, don't be pointing. Because some of you, you're married to this other picture. You have this right here. Ah. Some of you sighed. You felt good. You're like, do you steal that picture from HDTV? I mean, that doesn't seem legit. There's no way anybody lives like that in the real world, you know. I used to have a friend of mine. We'd go over to their house, and she would always say, never mind the house. We actually live here. This is not a museum. And so um, here's the thing. I'm not that good, you know, but but many of you, you kind of go, Ah, you know, I'm somewhere in the middle. Listen, listen, if you're like me and you have to clean your car to get people, like you start, like somebody says, hey, can I ride with you somewhere? And you start, you open up the passenger door and you start throwing out all the trash, the McDonald's bags, the Sonic bag, the Sonic cup, everything else. Don't know what that is. I must have ate that last week. You know, you had to throw everything out so somebody could get in the passenger seat. I was thinking you're going with picture number one. Um, Others of you, you could do surgery in your car. Nobody would get an infection because it's a completely sterile environment. And so I, I don't find myself in that category either. And so I started to ask you guys to raise your hand to which one you were. But then I thought, I made clutter sound so bad you would feel terrible. And so, and here's the thing. Go back to picture one, Jeff. It's okay if your closet looks like this. It's okay if your house looks like this. It doesn't bother me a bit. The thing is this. It's not okay for your life to look like this. See, the difficulty is this. It's it's fine for your closet. It's fine because God made us different. And some of you, this is just fine. Some of you, this really bothers you. And that's fine as far as your closet goes, completely fine. But it's just not okay for your schedule to look like this. It's not okay for your finances to look like this. It's not okay for your relationships to look like this. 
like this, to have so much clutter and so much stuff on your calendar to where what happens is this, we have so much and we're going and we're going and we're going and we're going and we never stop, we never breathe, we never pause, we never rest, we're just always going and going and we're spending and spending and if I need this, I'll charge it, oh well, I'll charge that. I remember talking to a deputy one time, not around here in Washita Parish, which tells you Louisiana, and I remember him saying, oh man, I've been working some overtime for Christmas because I got to pay down the travel ball credit card and I just kind of went... I need to walk away because I can't do this. I can't have this conversation because I'm just going this, this kind of clutter and this living over your limit at some point or another is going to cause you to stop enjoying life. I've seen it out of over 20 years of student ministry. Parents that run their kids ragged with every kind of ball camp that you can imagine and their kids stop enjoying the athletics that they used to love. I've seen multiple students graduate high school and refuse to play any kind of athletics in college because they were worn completely out. It's okay to be busy. It's okay to have things to do. It's okay to buy things. But not at the expense of the enjoyment of your life. Not at the expense of stress. That video stresses us completely out. It's bothersome. Really, quite frankly, it really is. It really is bothersome. So the point of this series and what I hope is that here's the thing. I know that I'm likely to get pushback. You can go, uh, you know, because we all have a different capacity. We all have a different red line. All of us have a different red line. Some of you have the capacity to take on more than others of you. But at the end of the day, we all have a limit. And the idea of breathing room is this, that there is a gap between your current pace and your limits for life. That there's some kind of gap. Some, some people don't have a gap. Financially, a lot of people don't have any kind of discretionary money. It, it's, they're one emergency away from just losing everything, everything just spiraling out of control. And in our effort to grab a hold and experience and have everything in this life, we lose control of our lives. And so my hope is this, that you and I can get to a place where we have a little bit of a, some breathing room, some breathing room on our calendars, some breathing room in our finances, some breathing room in our relationships because here's the thing if you spend all your time busy busy going going you will miss out on the thing that you and I both know is the most important thing and that's relationships you'll miss out on the relationships of the people who are around you even though you're all together and you're going together you will miss out on relationships with one another because you're so focused on the schedule. Now, when we run at max capacity, here's what happens. A couple of things happen. The first thing that begins to happen for all of us when we run, 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 run is our stress levels go up. Have you ever been late, especially for something important? You left the house late because chances are something happened that caused you to be late, like you were tired and you didn't want to get up. But, you know, you get up late, and now you're late. And what do they do? They radio dispatch every slow driver on the planet. <laughs> and your stress level begins to go up. And they tell all the red lights to turn red for an extended period of time. Why? Just because you need to be later. Because you're now stressed. You, you feel that you, isn't it true? When we're trying to get somewhere and I gotta hurry up and you're just bouncing from thing to thing and everybody's going slow, the mud turtles are out just poking along and you're just like, get out of the way. You're stressed, and you're angry. Doesn't it stress you out? You know what else happens? Your focus begins to narrow. See, whenever you're going and going, your focus begins to narrow in. And let's say you just live like within above the limits of finances. You know what all you think about? All you think about is how much money do I have? And all you think about is there's more month than money. And because you're stressed and because you're so focused on just that one thing, the natural happens. Your relationships begin to suffer. Your conversations are focused around how busy you are, your schedule, all the things you got going on, 
how much is this going to cost and how much is that going to cost and why did you buy that because we can't afford that. And we begin to allow the relationships, the thing that matters most to us, to suffer. And you might be asking, this is a long introduction, I apologize, but you may be asking, why do we do this to ourselves? Well, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. You just think, why would we do that? Why do we just always go to the max limits all the time? Why do we do that? I think it's a, the most logical explanation I can think of is this. Fear. I think it's fear. I think for parents, it's fear. I think for those who are spending, it's fear. Fear of missing out. What if I don't? What if, what if, what if? And, and there's fear for our kids. Like some people go, man, I want my kids to be involved in this because they need to get a scholarship because they want to be making it into the D1 school and they're going to be pros and all that kind of stuff. And there's this fear within you that if you don't have them at everything, they are going to get left behind. And I've heard parents say things like this and go, well, I'm afraid if. You're what? Afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid if I don't buy that, what are people going to think? I'm afraid if I don't live here, what are people going to think? There's this level of fear within us that we're going to miss out on something. And here's the thing. Your heavenly father, he loves you and has a better way. And I believe your heavenly father has a way that, that includes this. Some breathing room. Some margin. Some space, some space that allows you to focus on the things that matter most. I mean, all those things are important. And, and we're going to get to this here, here in just a second because you're, you're going to see this. Look, we're not the only ones that go from, from daylight to dark. And in the Old Testament, there was a group of people, and they were in slavery. And they were in slavery under the Pharaoh. And here's what they were taught. You get up. You work, you go to bed, and you go to sleep. And tomorrow, you do the same thing. And you're going to do the same thing the next day, and the next day, and the next day. There's no rest day. There is, we have to work. And the reason you have to work is if we, you don't work, we don't eat. That's just the way it works. And so God sends Moses in to rescue the people from slavery, but they still got this mentality that you got to work in order to eat and you've got to work every single day there is no stopping there is no break you're going to have to work every single day for the rest of your life or you will die and your family will die so you're gonna to have to work so maybe 14 or 16 hours a day you are going to work and God brings the people out of slavery into the wilderness and he takes them to a location a place called Sinai and he gives them something that I think is so amazing he gives them a word and a word is called Sabbath a word they hadn't heard of a concept they haven't lived and he says I want you to rest I want you to recharge I want what kind of heavenly father looks at you and says, you know what I want you to do? Rest. I love that. That's a great person. That's a great father. That's, a, that's something huge that he would actually sit there and look at you and say, you know what I want you to do? I want you to rest. Now the Pharisees grabbed a hold of this conversation years later and they went to this extreme. I mean, like you can't even break a head of grain. I mean, they just went nuts with it. And Jesus came back and said, look, look, look. I created the Sabbath for the benefit of you. Not for you to benefit the Sabbath. Not for you to beat people up about it. That's not what Sabbath has to do with at all. I created this because I want you to rest. And here's what Jesus is really trying to do. Here's what God was really trying to do in the Old Testament. You ready for this? We talk about it all the time. You ready? You sure? Trust. I want you to trust me. I want to give you a day of rest because I want you to trust me. I know you feel like if you don't work, you will starve to death. I want you to trust me. I want you to tr trust me that I'm going to take care of everything for you and you can have a break. I want you to trust me that parents, I love your kids and I know they need to go to a school. 
And I know that you can't afford to pay for college, but I want you to trust me. And then, so he does a couple of things in the Old Testament. See, we not only have the Ten Commandments, we have multiple commandments. And in Leviticus, he teaches them a couple of principles about trust. One of them was tithing and giving. One of them was a thing called gleaning. Now, many of you, you may not even know what I'm talking about with gleaning, so let's just look and see what I'm talking about. Here we go. So gleaning, here's how this works. In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 9, it says, When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields, and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. The edge of the area is called the glean area. That's where the glean is, all right? And the reason, you go, well, why would God do that? He says, look, there are things that are going to fall to the ground. There's going to be an edge to your, to your crop. And what I want you to do is I want you to just leave it behind. Yes, you could grab it and make more money. You could. You could grab it and have more stuff to sell. But I want you to trust me. That you don't have to take everything. That you don't have to live with this consumption assumption that it's all for my taking. It's all mine. I want you to do this. Why? Well, here we go. He actually goes on and tells, talks to them about grapes. It says, it is the same with your grape crop. Don't strip every bunch of grapes from the vines. And do not pick up the grapes that fall on the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners who live among you. So what you're going to do is you're going to leave something behind for people. You're going to leave some money on the table. You're not going to take every possible morsel that's out there. You're going to leave some out. You, and, and in doing that, you're going to take care. See, this is God's economy that you're going to take care of people who don't have what you have. And then he says this. I love this statement. I am the Lord your God. It's like, did we just change subjects? I mean, well, that's like a random thing. Did we, just, did we just change subjects or something? No, 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 no. God is saying, listen, I'm the Lord your God. And, and I, you know, you're going to leave some stuff behind. But I am the Lord your God. I want you to have some breathing room. I want you to trust me. I want you to really trust me that I am going to take care of you. Just like I'm taking care of the foreigners and the less fortunate around you, I'll take care of you too. And Deuteronomy tells it the same way. Deuteronomy 24, 19 says, When you are harvesting your crops and forget to bring in a bundle of grain from your field... Don't go back and get it. Don't have it. Hey, you missed some. Hey, go back and get that. That's a perfectly good bundle of grain. Go back there and get that. He says, just leave it. Don't go back. Don't go back. Leave it for foreigners and orphans and widows. And then the Lord your God will bless you in all you do. And maybe the question comes is we go, yeah, but, but God, what if there's a famine? Don't we need to go back and get that? Don't we need to get everything that we can get? I mean, we don't want to starve to death, God. And he's speaking to a group of people who are thinking, I've got to get everything I can possibly get and get every drop out of it that I can possibly get. And he's saying, no, 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 listen, I am the Lord your God. I will take care of you. I will handle whatever famine comes your way. I will handle the economy. I will handle all that. I've got it under control. You know, it's interesting. The, the world has been going around the sun in this perfect line and spinning at a certain rate. And should we waver one way or another, we are either really hot or really cold really fast. I think he can handle I mean, he's doing a great job. He really is. Contrary to what popular belief may be, God is okay.
And he is doing a great, great job, which is why in the New Testament, Jesus adds insult to injury a little bit here, makes it maybe a little bit worse. And it's a challenge for us, but he's speaking to the same group of people, not the same time frame, but the same group, same mentality, same one that we have a lot of times. And he goes on, and here's how he starts it in Matthew. He says, so don't worry about these things. Don't worry. Why are you worrying? It's 2023. We're old enough now not to worry. What are we worrying about? Don't worry about these things. You know, they'll be saying things like, well, what will we eat? Now, what he's not saying here, somebody's going to take this and they're going to slam somebody in here and go, you know, after church, somebody's going to say, where are we going to go to eat? And you're going to go, you know, Jesus said, no, don't, don't be mean. Don't be mean. Don't be mean. That's not what he's talking about. It's a bigger concept. What will we drink? And what will we wear? Well, if you got a closet like that first one, I hope you can find it. <laughs> These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. And what that really means here says pagans, but what that really means is this. They believe that there are gods, and those gods don't care about you. Those gods aren't going to take care of you. They're not going to step in and rescue you. They just don't care about you. That's, that's the kind of gods he's talking about here, these unbelievers. He, this, these guys just couldn't care less about you. But your heavenly father, and I love it because he gets down to the issue for all of us. But your heavenly father already knows your needs. What if? I mean, if you haven't been listening, maybe you're counting the carpet threads or whatever, wondering how many lights we got. What if you really grabbed a hold of that concept no matter how old you are? He knows what you need. He already knows. You know he knows that your kids need to go to a good school? He knows that. He knows your kids need a scholarship. He knows that. He knows that you need a retirement. And he knows that the stock market seems to plummet and we lose more money than we gain every year. Or at least for I do. I mean, you know, I lose a lot of money every year the past couple of years. He knows one of these days I want to retire. He knows one of these days I want to need something to live off of. He knows what you need. He knows that you need your light bill covered, taken care of. He already knows. He knows about your health. He knows all about it. He designed you, remember? I'm like the great physician, which means he gets like an A plus in anatomy and physiology every time because he designed it. He knows. He already knows all this stuff that we allow ourselves to get consumed with. He knows. He knows all about it. When I was in college, I would have said this. He knows that you need to get a good grade. And he also knows you need to study more. But, you know, we won't go into that. We're not going to talk about that. But he knows. He knows you need to get a job. For some of you, you need to hear that. He knows you need that. He knows some of you need a raise. Because the economy's wore you out. He knows all this stuff. He knows the pressure that you feel to be involved in stuff, to buy certain things, to have a certain look about yourself, a certain swag or whatever. He knows all about it. And then he comes and he says, so instead, I got a better way. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Doesn't mean don't do anything. Doesn't mean become lazy. Just says seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. Now that doesn't mean, this is not a connected statement. If you'll do this and do this, then God, that's not a connective statement. It basically means this. You can seek the kingdom of God above all else and you can live righteously. You want to know why? Because he's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of you either way. This is not a legalistic statement because that and sometimes people think, well, you got to seek first and then you got to live righteously. And if you do those things, then God will be nice to you. That's not what this statement is at all. We can go look at the Greek if you would like. He's going to give you everything you need so you don't have to worry. He's going to give you everything you need so you can live righteously. You don't have to become dishonest. You don't have to cram your calendar full of everything because he's going to take care of you he is going to give you everything that you need he knows everything about you 
You don't have to live at a pace where it seems like your life is spinning out of control. You don't have to trade your peace for prosperity. You don't have to trade your peace for progress. You don't. You can have breathing room. And that is what this series is going to be all about. And us getting to a place where we enter into 2023 really believe in this statement that the Lord knows what you need. He already knows. And, and guess what? He cares. He cares. He knows what you need, and he cares. You don't have to live life at the limits. You don't have to redline and have so much clutter in your life. You don't have to do that. Your schedule doesn't have to look so insane that you can't even have an anniversary with your spouse. You don't have to run around after every single opportunity, grasping for every straws, and, and what really causes your, you or your kids to not enjoy their life anymore. You can have some breathing room. And here's what I think. You'll be just fine. I'm even going to take it a step further. If you'll create breathing room in your life, I think you'll enjoy your life more. Because time and time, we've seen this over and over again, time and time again, I have seen men run themselves ragged. And they think they're doing it in the, in the name of, I'm trying to make something better, life, better life for my family. But I, I see them run themselves literally ragged. And then what happens? A bomb goes off in the family. And she's ready to leave because you're distant and you're not here. And then he begins to spend all his time focusing on the relationship he's about to lose. If he'd have just spent time along, he would have been fine. I've seen it with, with families with kids. That parents spend all their time going and going and they go here and they're at this town today and this town this week and this town next week and this town next week. And then about 15, 16 years old, the wheels fall off with that kid and the kid goes crazy. And then they come in and they're like, what am I supposed to do? And they spend all their time and their resources and their money trying to put the family back together. When all along, had they lived with some breathing room, they would have had time. And it would have been better. And I think that you and I can get this right. And here's what I also think. That the people in this room who are in, above 60, they're all sitting out there going, yeah. They are. I mean, I'm looking at them. You can't see them, but I'm looking at them. They're going, yeah. They would say, I would trade a little bit of prosperity for more peace. I, I would trade some progress for some peace. If I could go back. See, we, we, we're there. 20s, 30s, 40s, we're there. Teenagers, you're there. We get the opportunity to create some breathing room. So my homework assignment for you is just simply this. Here's a question. Where do you need some breathing room? Where do you need some breathing room? Maybe the conversation at lunch with your family. Maybe the conversation with somebody. Maybe with your spouse. Or maybe you have a little group of people. Maybe a little group of people here. Or maybe a little group of people out of here. And you just ask yourselves this question going, where, where do I need some breathing room? Where can I begin to kind of declutter some stuff? Where can I eliminate some of the things that really don't matter in the long run? We can, we can have a little bit more time with each other. We can have a little bit more quality time with one another. And maybe sacrifice some stuff that really is not a big deal anyway. But to really ask ourselves this question, where, where could I use some breathing room in my calendar, in my time? Where could I use some breathing room with my finances? Where could, I, where could I do to give myself just a little bit of the ability to do this in 2023? To be able to just go and be okay. Your Heavenly Father knows your needs. And He will take care of you and you can trust Him no matter what. Because I think He's got a better way for you. 
I think he's got a better plan. At the end of the day, his plan is better, and you can trust him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you give us. We thank you that you know all of our needs. You know all of our wants. You know the desires of our hearts. But Lord, we just want to be able to lay down at night and close our eyes and go to sleep and not think about all the million things we've got to do tomorrow. We need some breathing room. Help us to see where that breathing room needs to be. I pray that you will help us to see that. And that we can have deeper relationships, that we can have a better quality of life, that we can actually enjoy being alive, that we don't have to run 90 to nothing. Father, help us to trust you, don't to fear no more, to not worry about missing out in effort to experience what really matters most. We love you and we thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, we want to thank you for being here. Happy New Year. Happy 2023. We'll see you next week as we continue this series called Breathing Room. Y'all have a great, great week. It's a new day. Oh, it's a new time. And there's a new way. I'm going to live my life.